let's talk about debugging. Like I said, I skipped a couple chapters to do this sooner, and I'm quite pleased with how that looks because debugging is fun. And disassembly is tougher, and it should come later after. After you've done debugging first, it gets you more used to assembly code. So disassembler takes compiled code and turns it into assembly code just so you can read it. And then you have to actually read and understand the assembly code, which is something most people can't do. So this is pretty rough. And this is the oldest way to do it. This is what I thought malware analysis would have to be. That's why I thought it would be too hard. But debuggers do the same thing. They take the compiled code and show it to you in assembly code, but they can run it and put breakpoints in and stop it partway through, and you can modify it as it runs. And that turns out to be much easier for the same reason that dynamic analysis is much easier than static analysis, because you can skip over the boring parts of the code, get to the part you care about, put a breakpoint there, and just look at the little bit you want. It turns out that even people that really don't know much about computers at all can figure out like how to cheat on a Windows game. They can find the, the number that is how many points you start with or something and just make it bigger or something like that. It's really not that hard to do. And that's enough to get you pretty far. And we're going to do some stunts like that. So your debugger will show you uh, all, this, all the memory and the registers and the functions. And you can stop them and you can change it as it runs. So there's two main debuggers out there. There's Ollie Debug and there's another one, Immunity Debugger, which is just somebody that bought the software and made another version that's essentially the same. Um, and these are your main ones for Windows. And then there's Ida Pro is the main disassembler. And it has some debugging features, but they aren't very valuable. Ida Pro is there's a free version that's limited. It's very daunting. We'll use it later. It's like Photoshop. It's huge and complicated and sort of baffling at first. WinDebug is what you have to use to debug the kernel. And we'll do some of that. Thanks to Mark Rasinovich, kernel debugging has gotten much easier. And uh, that, that is not that bad. Not as bad as it used to be. It used to be very difficult to set up and frustrating. And it's gotten a lot easier. So there's two kinds of debuggers out there. This is one split. There are user land debuggers and kernel debuggers. WinDebug can do user land or kernel. And Ollie can only do user land. So that's one big issue. Another big one is whether you have a source code debugger or an assembly code debugger. Real developers use source level debuggers, where you write in C or something, and then you make put a breakpoint at one line of your C code, and you look at the C variables, and you never look at the assembler. Because you don't want to. You know C. Why would anybody look at assembler voluntarily when you could write in something nicer like C? This is what real developers do. And it's fine, but it only works if you have the source code. So it pretty much is only for code you develop or open source code, where somebody actually gives you the source, which is fine for most people that are builders. They're trying to make something productive. But for us, who are trying to reverse malware, we are not going to have the source. So we're down to this assembly level debugging, which is not something a normal developer would ever touch, because it's much more difficult. Now, Windows crashes. I don't know if you've been using this long enough. You may remember Dr. Watson popping up in your Windows 95 apps crash. Uh, when a program crashes in user land, it reaches an illegal instruction like a divide by zero or something. It cannot, or it jumps to an address that is outside its allowable space. It can't continue, so it sends an exception to the processor, which says, I give up. I can't run this horrible program anymore. And the, the operating system handles it with some default and this is what it does. It brings up a box saying your program has stopped working, and then it gives you some options. And one of the options is to debug the program, and that will launch your default debugger. And if you, your default debugger on Windows systems is usually WinDebug. It used to be something called Dr. Watson. Seems to have gone the way of the dodo bird. And so um, you could, in principle, open it. It gives you a little bit of information down here about why it crashed. And um, in principle, you can open it with a debugger, but typically nobody wants to unless you're the author of the code. All right, so like I say, user mode debugging is where we're going to do most of our work. Most of the user land is where normal code is written. That's where we're going to do most of what we're doing here. Um, so you run the debugger on the same system as the code you're analyzing, and it is just running in its own process on the same OS. And so is the debugger, just running in user land as a process. If either one of them crashes, the whole machine doesn't crash. It just crashes that one process and puts up an error message. This is where most normal computer use happens in user land, and it's where most malware is. Kernel, kernel code is hard to write, and it's bad. kernel malware is hard to write, and that's only for the higher level attackers. Now, kernel mode debugging, if you want to do it, then you would like to be able to, say, put a breakpoint in the kernel and examine the state of the kernel while it is stopped. So that means the computer you are examining is stopped. So you can't have just one computer. So what you have to have is two computers, and the original plan was you must connect them with a serial cable from one to the other. Microsoft, we would sell you a special cable for this. 
Uh, the serial ports don't even exist on modern hardware. So Microsoft with Windows 8 started supporting uh, Ethernet connections between the two machines, but it never worked when I had my students try to do it on Windows 7 and Windows 8. And on it goes. But that's the point. The Microsoft's official way to do this with the two computers, that's how they write Microsoft Windows. When they're writing the kernel, they have to debug the kernel, and they do it with two computers put together. That was the standard way. And I, had, I gave my students projects in this, and it had a lot of entertaining side effects. Um, one of the ones is, um, the, you know, I probably should have written my projects back when I made students do this a few years ago, where what they had to do was boot, press F8, and then go down here into debugging mode. That was what you should do. Then you're in debugging mode, and now your machine can be a slave to another machine with a cable, and you can debug the kernel. Um, the problem if you do that is there's a key, the print screen key. It's also called sysrequest. That will that's what starts debugging. So it will freeze your current machine create and, and start debugging mode. And if you're not actually connected to another machine, you get the blue screen of death. So when I gave students this homework, everybody else tried to take screenshots for their homework, and the machine would die right at that point. This was not popular in the lab. And um, in retrospect, I should have just had them reboot and press F8. So they were in debugging mode temporarily. But what I had them do was use BCD edit to make another boot option that had debugger on. And since it was the new option, it became the default. So this machine continued to be in that mode for the rest of the semester, frustrating everyone. And of course, this points out another thing, which is also my fault. I should never should have written instructions that said hit the print screen key. It should have said hit shift print screen. Because technically, shift print screen is the print screen, and print screen without the shift is just request, which is for this purpose. But I didn't know that. So you know. Anyway, it's all over now because I'm not doing any of this real debugging anymore. Because you don't have to. Um, so that's the joy of, of shift debug. People would do their homework right at the last minute, poof, blue screen of death. They did not enjoy that very much. Um, my students have put up a lot of abuse for me. You're not the first. But I should mention in passing that um, people have complained that they can't figure out if they've got enough points in Canvas, so I'm trying to clean it up. I'm, I'm taking a Canvas course, so I removed half the items from the menu. I'm trying to make it easier. Canvas is pretty baffling to me, and it looks like it's pretty baffling to you, too. Uh, I'm trying to clean it up. But uh, So you're going to see a lot of changes, and please let me know if you can't find things or if things seem wrong in Canvas. I'm trying to make it so you can easily tell what you have to do each week, and you can easily tell if you have enough points. So far, I have not achieved that, and I'm aware of that, but I'm working on it. Live KD is the new way. This is awesome. Mark Rasinovich is the king of making beautiful Windows tools that make it easy to do the hard things, and Live KD is one of them. So what Live KD does, I thought Live KD took a crash. Now, you can use WinDebug to analyze a crash dump, not the live kernel. Now, I thought that's what Live KD does, but it is even much smarter than that. He tells WinDebug that it's analyzing a crash dump, but then he connects it to the real kernel on your machine. So he explains here how he does it. You can satisfy reads of the virtual dump file with the contents of physical memory. So he creates a virtual crash dump, which consists of your real live kernel, which is bloody brilliant. So all he has to put in is like a driver that makes your living kernel appear to be a file. And now the debugger can run on one machine thinking it's looking at a file when it's really looking at the real machine. Now, I would wonder what would happen if you tried to put a breakpoint in the kernel. I imagine you can't do that. I haven't tried. Logically, it would crash your machine. I don't understand how you could possibly have a break. But you can totally see your kernel and what it's doing without having a second machine, which is very nice. And we'll do, we'll do that when the time comes. All right. And uh, I highly recommend this Joe McRae video from B-Sides Rhode Island a couple years ago about exploit development. This is part of why I taught an exploit development class, because uh, this video, Joe McRae is one of the best teachers in this space. There's a few people that are doing the same thing I'm doing. They're trying to take this hacking stuff and make it available to relatively uh, not advanced people, trying to make it easy, simple enough. And Joe is very good at it. He's on the East Coast, he does great work. And um, he had exploit development for mere mortals. He gave a talk explaining how to use Ollie Debug that wasn't baffling. And that was part of my beginning, seeing how good this is. Also, Georgia Weedman's book. Georgia Weedman is one of his students, and now she's a big shot in training, too. There's a, I'm like one of four or five people out there that's really in the business of taking the most difficult stuff and trying to make it easy. And uh, I really follow these guys a lot. We're all trying to do the same thing in various ways. I'm the one with yes, a steady paycheck from a college, which is nice. These guys are like on their own independently trying to sell videos or something, which looks pretty tough. But last time I talked to Joe, he's traveling to all sorts of European and Mideastern countries, teaching over there, making, I guess, a pile of money. I don't know. Anyway, um, but, there, but his video there is very inspiring. He explains how to use Ollie in simple terms 
that are not confusing. And I really appreciate that. Anyway, all right, which technique displays assembly code but does not let you run it? Okay, that's disassembly. Good. All right. Which technique requires two computers connected together? Okay, that's kernel debugging. And by the way, I had students doing it in the virtual machines with a virtual serial cable made with a named pipe, and that really didn't work. Boy, they suffered. Only worked about half the time. You're, you be glad I'm not doing those projects anymore. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, which technique is almost never used by malware analysts? Okay. Source level, because you don't have the source code. That is an option not available to you. The others you might use. All right. All right, if you get the blue screen of death, how do you debug it? You've got to do kernel debugging, and there are two ways to do it, by the way. You can go back and do it again on a machine connected to another machine, so when it crashes, you get information, or you can let the blue screen of death create a memory crash dump, and then you can analyze the dump in WinDebug. Those are both ways to do it. And if you read um, Linux exploitation tools, I mean, I teach the uh, 127 class in uh, exploiting systems. In Linux, we have live code. We run it in GDB and let it crash. There are whole tutorials that don't do it that way. They turn on crash dumps and let the program crash and then analyze the crash dump with GDB. It is another way to go where you make a static file and analyze the file. This is, of course, better if you pay Microsoft for a service contract then they will tell you, email the crash dump to us and we will figure it out and fix your problem. So that's what it's for. And in many people just get used to that system and they don't try to debug it live at all. They always work from crash dump files. So you can have another team analyzing to find your problem. So I mean, it is, uh, that's a thing to be aware of. That is a technique that works just as well once you get used to it. So I got Melanson, I know who that is. And Forrest, I think that's a real name too. And, uh, Tip, tip, I know who that is. All right, so a debugger. Now, there's two ways to do this. You can launch the debugger and then run the program inside the debugger, like you might open Word and then open a Word document. Another way you can do it is have the program already running, and the debugger can attach itself to a running process. They both accomplish approximately the same thing. Um, what happens when, now the debugger is actually written in a language like Python. It's probably not very fast. And what a debugger actually does is change the contents of RAM for the running program. So um, anyway, uh, debugging lets, what it can do is it can show you the code. And if you put a breakpoint in, it changes a byte of the code to CC, which is an int three. And then it breaks at that point, and when it sends the exception, the debugger catches the exception and freezes the program. So that's one, that's the main function of a debugger is to insert breakpoints in code, and that's how it really works. It keeps stopping your program so you can examine it. And it does it just by changing the RAM image of the program. There is a single step mode in the processor and in the debugger where you step one by one. In Ollie, you do it with F7. This is often quite useful. I've done, I didn't use it when I was a new analyst. I did these books, and they all say put a breakpoint in, put a breakpoint in, and then I'd have CTF problems. You have this weird code. I don't know what it's doing at all. And I learned you can actually do pretty far. Step, 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 step. See what's going on. In fact, it's pretty good for beginners to use a lot of single steps. Just get somewhere close to what you care about and then figure out what's happening. It's, it's more transparent. But of course, it runs very slowly. So um, here's, for example, some malware, which is like one of your projects where it is doing an XOR here. And what this is doing is XORing you start, you put in EDI, the address of something, 406904. Now in Windows, programs always live at 400,000 hex. They all think they are there. They are at virtual addresses. So this is 6,904 in hex past the beginning. This is somewhere in the storage area for this program. So this is a variable. And so it loads that area. Then it puts um, ECX here, and it takes EDI, it XORs it with 09C, then it increments EDI, and then it loops. So this is going to do single byte XOR encryption with a fixed key of 9C. So the point is this string is something they don't want us to know, like a password or uh, some kind of something that the malware author does not want us to find when we run strings. So they XORed it all with 9C, which will make it all unprintable ASCII stuff because it'll change the high order bits. So this will not show up in strings anymore. And this code will um, decrypt it. 
and this is why I had that very simple example in assembler of this issue, it is very common that the malware authors hide their strings in some way like this, and there is some code that will decrypt it to use it, and then encrypt it again so it doesn't persist. And so you'd have to find it and then put a, let it decrypt and then put a breakpoint here, and then you can look and see what it is. And that's one of the simplest uses of a debugger, is to stop programs partway through so you can see what's happening because they're smart enough to remove it from memory. And this, I've noticed, is the way browsers are now, although they didn't used to be. If you log in with a password in a browser, it doesn't just leave it sitting there forever. It's only in there briefly, and then it's gone. When you look at the memory dump later, people are wising up. Um, for a long time, people had the habit of just, so here we are, single stepping through, and you see it slowly loading LOA, load library switch. So it's the library function name is what it hid here. And if you single step through your code, you can often see things just growing in the debugger. It's very nice. All right, uh, when you are debugging, if you're going to do a single step, you have to decide what a single step means. Now, if a single step means the next assembly language instruction, then what if you had a call? What if I called print? Now I'm going to move out of the code the developer wrote into a Windows library and then into the kernel. Now, do I really want to be debugging inside the kernel? The answer is probably not. Unless I am trying to find a zero day in the Windows operating system, which is quite advanced and probably not where we want to be in this class, I really want to stay in user land. I don't really want to examine the internal workings of the kernel. I'm just willing to treat that as a black box. So that's why you use step over. Step over will go to the next instruction at the current level. So if you call a subroutine, step over will go into the routine, run, finish it, and come back and go to the next instruction up in this program. Don't go into the subroutines. And that's usually what you want. You might do step into because you, you, have, you have various subroutines that are part of your program. Like you have main, and it calls check password, and check password calls decrypt, and then it calls a kernel routine. So you do a step into, a step into, and then a step over to avoid wandering into the interstices of the operating system where you were going to find thousands of lines of junk that you don't care about because you're not going to expect to find bugs down there. You can put breakpoints in. I put a breakpoint in a program. So um, here, for example, I'm going to do some kind of calculation on EBP plus some variable called arg0. Then I'm going to move something in EAX and call EAX. So I calculated an address, and I went to that address. So the, de the disassembler and the debugger cannot tell me what it's calling. I don't know because this address is created dynamically at runtime. So you put a breakpoint here, go to this point, and then I can see what's in EAX. Then I find out where it's going. So that's one of the many cases in which you'd want to stop it. So here's something that's going to create a file name and then create a file. So here it is with .txt. It's going to add to the end, and it's going to build a file name step by step here. And then it's going to create a file. And when it does it, the variables are going to be loaded here. Remember, that's always this case. You call a subroutine, and then the parameters are going to be in all these pushes. Push, 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 push. Those are all the parameters. One of those is going to be the file name, and it's calculating the file name, adding text to the end of it. So again, you'd let it calculate, put a breakpoint before it calls it, and see what file it's creating. And this is very common in malware because it creates a so-called random file name or connects to a random URL, but it's not really random. There's a pattern, and the bad guy knows what they are, and you don't. And this is an easy way to find out. And then there's WinDebug. WinDebug looks like this. It's one of Microsoft's goofy products that shows you a window as if it was a Windows product, but it really seems to be a command line product. And um, you type commands down here, and they appear up there. And you can see you have breakpoints are going to get hit, and you have ESP and EBP and EIP. You have the same old registers shown up here. It has it's showing the same information, but it's not very easy to read. It's uh, like a DOS command line presentation of the data, so it takes a little practice to get used to reading it. Ollie works a lot harder at making this easy to see. That's why I start with Ollie and do WinDebug later. WinDebug is much more primitive looking and more frustrating. Is there, is there any occasion where we use WinDebug over? Yes, for kernel debugging, you must use WinDebug. Got it. And the real Microsoft experts, like I think Joe McRae too says, you just get used to it, use WinDebug all the time, forget everything else. Once you're good at it, eh, who needs all that fancy stuff? But beginners, take any crutch you can get. Because the first thing you do is say, oh, this is too hard, and just give up. So you want to do an easy version to avoid that. Anyway, um, so again, if something's encrypted, going to be sent over the network, you can put a breakpoint um, before it's encrypted and view it before it's encrypted, because then you can see what happens. So here's something that will um, view the data before the program encrypts it. By here, it's going to call encrypt data. It loaded the data. 
and put a pointer to the data in the stack. So I stop here. I can just look at what it's about to encrypt before it encrypts it. That's an easy answer. So this is what Ollie looks like, and we'll be using it later. Um, Ollie gives you um, assembly code here. And I probably mentioned this before, but I'll mention it again. Whenever you're presented with a screen full of baffling garbage, start on the right. This is a technique that seems to be true for all the tools I've come across. They put the easy stuff on the right, and they put the complicated stuff on the left. I don't know why it is that way, but here we got hexadecimal codes for the instruction, which are pretty baffling. Here we got the assembly language, which is somewhat less baffling. And here we got something really easy, like the name of the API call, get version, get module handle. This is like English. And over here, we got the registers, which are pretty easy to understand. EAX and EIP is the instruction pointer, and ESP and EBP are the top and bottom of the stack. And if these are pointing to something, it tells you what it's pointing to. So this is pointing to a kernel 32 routine. This is pointing to part of PuTTY and so on. So if you had something being decrypted, it would probably have a register pointing to it, and you would just see the string here growing. It's very common. You just see readable things appear here. So like I say, the way to do this is to think like a small child that reads a magazine, and they can't even see the words. They just look at the pictures. Run it and look for some part of it that's easy, and pay attention to that part at first. And that's often enough to give you a clue. And then as time goes on, you can get into the more difficult parts. But it is not useless if you only do the simple things here. That's a good start. So there's two kinds of breakpoints. The most common is software execution, but there's also a couple others, hardware execution and conditional. Software execution is the only kind I ever use, really. Uh, this is the typical plain ordinary breakpoint. You get it by pressing F2 and Ollie debug. Thing turns red. That is where it replaces the current instruction in RAM with CC. So when it goes there, it will break back to the debugger. And then when it runs it again, it will put the right value back in there so it can continue running. Uh, that is the simplest thing. And you can have as many of them as you want because it's just held in the memory of the debugger. It can have a, like an array of all the CCs that have been put in. And it remembers to just what should be put in there. It just costs it enough memory to remember one byte and an address for each one of those. So you can have as many as you want. And uh, that's what you normally use. So the debugger will tell you that there's a 55 here, but what's really there is a CC, because it's going to break when it hits that point. And the debugger remembers that what it, it should have been there is a 55, and when you hit F7 to resume execution, it will put the 55 and keep going. So it shows you a 55, but it's lying to you. It's letting you see the original code with some kind of mark to tell you it's a breakpoint. In Ollie debug, it turns red. But that means, of course, the real Assembly, real machine language instructions must be different than what you're seeing on the screen because the machine has no way to know it has put a breakpoint there without having the code be altered. All right, so this means there are certain conditions under which this won't work. For example, if there's some kind of integrity check and the code does like a checksum of those values, it's not going to get the right value because that's not really the right byte there. And uh, if it tries to change this during code execution, something bad is going to happen because the expected value is not there. So I've never seen this happen. But in principle, this debugging thing could lead to problems. And I must say, disassembly is also pretty um, buggy. Remember, nothing is perfect. The thing I was really surprised when I got to the anti-disassembly techniques that come in the advanced chapters here, I was not aware that when Ida Pro disassembles a program, it is guessing. You can write code which executes to do one thing, but the disassembler misunderstands it and lies to you about what it is. That is pretty strange. I would think that you could just totally duplicate the steps that the processor would do when executing it, but that is not what disassemblers do. Disassemblers make certain assumptions to make it faster, and one of the normal assumptions they make is that all the code is packed as densely as possible. So if there's five bytes in the first instruction, the next byte will be the next instruction. The next byte will be the next instruction. So if you want to follow up a disassembler, all you have to do is put gaps in the code, extra instructions that don't do anything in between the real instructions, or extra bytes that you sort of jump over. And the disassembler will get totally baffled by that. Because it's not really stepping through the code. It's just looking at it and trying to read it. It's sort of like a person with dyslexia. You know, we're trying to read something, but they get a few letters flipped. So suddenly, they can't make the words right or anything. And it's, you can do that to the debugger, to the disassembler. Anyway, just a thing to be aware of. So it's yeah. more than just translating the op codes. It's because no, it's op be codes don't line up exactly. No, it's because it does just translate the op codes, and it doesn't try to execute them. So if you have, if you have a code, and then you jump forward three bytes, it doesn't 
figure out that you jumped forward three bytes and assume the next instruction will start three bytes ahead. It just takes the next byte, calls it an opcode, because it is too stupid. It doesn't try to run it. This is like um, if you were translating something and you just took every letter and tried to look it up in a dictionary, like Google Translate, trying to translate it into German, a few typos in your English would totally ruin it, right? So it's almost as the first pass has to be that guess, but then Ida Pro has to go back in again and execute the program and make sure that it caught all the right sort of opcodes and where the opcodes are located. That would be good, but Ida Pro does not do that, and I'm not sure anything does that. I think that turns out to be too difficult and expensive. So uh, uh, as far, nothing I'm aware of does that. There may be something. But as far as I know, there are two choices. There are static disassemblers like IDA that show you what the code looks like. And there are debuggers that run it. And nothing in between that I'm aware of. Although there are a lot of brilliant people with There's probably some new product. But uh, we will get the anti-disassembly. There are obfuscation techniques that will befuddle your analysis tools. And of course, the bad guys love that. So it is. eventually we will have malware that does this. Another thing I probably mentioned before, it came out about a year ago. Uh, someone proved that move is NP complete. So you can write a program and you can make a compiler, and he wrote the compiler that will compile your code and there'll be absolutely nothing there but move instructions. Because you could even do an if with a move instruction. You can move something, and under certain conditions it will create an exception, and then the exception handle will move the code to another point. So you can make a jump and you can make an if with move. So if you do that, it will run, but it will be very, very hard to read and understand. So that would be a pretty good way to make your virus befuddle the malware analyst. I haven't seen a real one do that. Well, I have seen CTF problems that are all move, and you're trying to figure out what the hell. <laughs> it's pretty easy to, it's hard enough anyway, even when you have normal code. When you make it messed up code, it can become practically impossible. So anyway, uh, that's the memory contents. We talked about that. Okay. Um, there's a thing called hardware execution breakpoints. This is the alternative, where you do not modify the code at all and you put in a breakpoint. This is what you do if you're really serious. The, there are special registers just for this. You can have four hardware execution breakpoints. And then, when it goes to those addresses, it will stop. And nothing has changed. It's in the processor. This is the perfect way to do it. And the debugger can use these if you want to. But there's never more than a total of four of them. And um, that's the that's thing. But this is, this is the way to really make it stop no matter what at that, when it hits that instruction. Um, now, you could try to change those registers in your malware to turn off the breakpoints. And that might work. There is a countermeasure available. It will try to detect if someone is trying to change the registers and cause an extra breakpoint there to try to stop bad guys from doing that. But it is very fragile. It only looks for um, a certain instruction. And there are other instructions that could indirectly do it, which it would not stop. So you know, there is, they did try to make it so that you can't turn off the hardware breakpoints. But in fact, you can. It's just a little bit difficult. And then there are conditional breakpoints, which are implemented in software of the debugger. He puts in a breakpoint. You can say, I only want to break if certain thing happens. Like, I have some loop that happens 10,000 times, and one of them is finally going to happen when the accumulator is zero, and that's the one that matters. So I don't want to hit F9 to resume executing 1,000 times. I want it to break on this statement, but only when a certain condition is true. So the debugger will put a CC in and break every time. Then in the debugger's Python code, it'll say, oh, it's time to resume, and it'll hit F7 for you to resume. So it will continue until the condition is true, but it makes your code much, much slower. Because now it keeps having to jump from assembly code out to Python back and forth. So anyway, that's the game here. You do have these conditional breakpoints. You don't need use these in fairly complicated cases. And we're not doing any of those in the homework I'm assigning you. But they might come up in the real world. So that's the game. Conditional breakpoints are OK. But of course, they mean you're actually executing a lot more commands in the debugger. And the debugger is much slower than the code you're disassembling, typically. So it will slow you down. All right. Yeah. Isn't there also another flag, like a trap flag and a uh, register? There is. And a uh, trap flag you can turn on, and then it will stop after every instruction. That's the point. And that is how you do single stepping from hardware. No. Good. And I bet there is some way to befuddle that, but I'm not aware of it. There's usually a countermeasure for any of these things. That's the, uh, that's the nature of all security. 
you build a wall so the crooks build ladders, so you build a higher wall so the crooks build more ladders, and that's the way it always is. That's why if you submit a talk to DEF CON, in the CFP proposal they say, if you are proposing an attack, what is the defense, and then what is the attack that will get over that? And if you're proposing a defense, what is the attack that gets past it, and what's the better defense that will stop it? Because we aren't even going to wait for, well, no, those are going to be the first questions about every talk. So you have to address that. <coughs> nothing is ever finished, nothing is ever final, whatever you've done, there is a countermeasure. <laughs> anyway, that's why we're here. This is an exciting field. Every day something new happens that turns yesterday's wisdom on its head. So whatever we're doing that we're proud of today, people will be laughing at us for being such fools in a few years for doing that stupid thing. <laughs> that's why if you've been around for a while, you hopefully get more tolerant of people doing stupid things. You begin to realize there really is no other choice. All you can ever do is meet the current standards and they're never good enough in a few years. And it's not that we're all idiots. We're, most of us are just doing the best we can, but that's the way it is. <laughs> anyway, I'll give it a few more seconds. So the most common kind of breakpoint. That's your typical software execution breakpoint. All right, what kind makes your program slow? OK, that's the conditional breakpoint that keeps having to run code in the debugger after each breakpoint, which slows it down. All right, which one uses interrupt number three? Those are the software execution breakpoints. Int three is CC and hex. That is the classic instruction. And I assume, I haven't looked in it, but I think anything numbered int three must go all the way back to MS-DOS and way back there. It must be one of the really early interrupt processes because you've needed this from the beginning of computer programming. How do I stop it halfway through to see what's wrong? Anyway, all right, so which one might cause you to miss important functionality? Okay, that's step over. I didn't mention it, but it was there. If you step over, then if you call a subroutine, it does something and comes back, and maybe something important happened in the subroutine, so step over has a chance of missing something that you wanted to look at. So that is, of course, the downside of it. All right, so forest is twice. And tip tip is twice, that's six, and Peter D. So we'll talk about exceptions a bit. Um, the exceptions are what runs whenever some code cannot proceed under an exceptional condition, it calls an exception handler, and this is going to be very important to us. So this is what debuggers are using. Int3 is technically an exception. So is an attempt to access memory you don't have permissions to access, an attempt to access invalid memory, invalid instructions division by zero, all these things cause exceptions because the program cannot continue operating normally. And so it sends out an exception call to the operating system saying, I, a bad thing has happened here, you better do something about it. Now, if you're running a debugger, the first time an exception happens, it tells the debugger, I hit an exception because this might be a breakpoint the debugger put there. It's not really a problem with the code. It is just for diagnostic purposes. So it hands up to the debugger, do you want to handle this? Now the debugger can say, no, I don't wish to handle that exception. Go back and see if the programmer wrote an exception handler to handle it. And let the programmer's exception handler attempt to handle it. And if the programmer did write a good exception handler, that will be the end. There will not be another exception. If that doesn't work, there'll be a second exception. Meaning I didn't stop, I didn't stop it the first time, and when I handed it to the program, it just crashed again. So now there's definitely a problem. So the second exception is the one the debugger will typically stop and then tell you, dude, your program has a real problem here. So that's the thing to know. Um, that's the second chance. The debugger is given a second chance, so the program doesn't just crash and pop up an operating system message. You're, you, the whole point of the debugger is when you have a problem, it should show you what's going on and let you see it. So that's the game. First chance exceptions you can typically ignore because we do want to let the default exception handler get a chance, but second chance exceptions can't be ignored. If you pass them back to the program, it's just going to give up and hand it to the operating system and you'll pop an operating system error message, which is not terribly useful to us. The whole point of running a debugger is you want to get more information than that. So. Um, Int 3 is the software breakpoint. You can single stepping in a debugger is done as an exception. If you turn on the trap flag uh, register, then it will execute one instruction and always create an exception after each instruction. So it keeps on stopping, jumping back to the debugger. Um, all right, so memory access violation is when you try to um, access memory that is outside your uh, segment, so you're not allowed to use it, or you try to do what you're not allowed to do with the memory. You try to execute memory in a segment that is not executable, 
or you try to write to an area that is not writable, you're not allowed to do whatever you're trying to do, that's an access violation. If it's violating privilege rules, like say a similar one, um, when you have broke the rules, for example, you attempt to execute ring zero instructions from ring three. Um, when you're running in user land mode, certain instructions that are in the processor are not allowed for you. They're only for the kernel, and if you try to execute them, you'll get a privilege violation. So you can find a list of exceptions online, and on they go. Um, here's exception three, the breakpoint. Here's the non-maskable interrupt, single step debug exception, divide by zero, and there are many others. And those are the codes for this. And that's what we're playing with. So you can modify execution with a debugger. You can put in a breakpoint, and then you can decide to change what it does. You can change the value of registers, change the value of memory. You can even move the instruction pointer to jump over some code. Um, this sort of thing. You could avoid a function call by putting a breakpoint uh, before the call and then change the instruction pointer after it so it doesn't do that. Now, this will probably follow up the program. Whatever was supposed to happen in there won't happen, but you can get over some, you can do some progress past a point. Yeah. So to change the instruction pointer, do I literally just highlight the instruction pointer? Yeah, right just click it or just type yeah. it? Yeah, I think you just right click it. I haven't okay. done it much, but I think you just modify it right there in Ollie. I know in um, GDB, you just type a command to write to it. So I mean, it's, the debugger can totally do it, just of course, it's probably going to follow up your, your machine. And this is what we do in the exploit development class. We do we corrupt the stack, so we execute more code, but then usually the program crashes after that because you have, you were in a subroutine, and instead of finishing the subroutine and returning normally, you jump somewhere else. So unless you know how to clean up the damage you've done, when it does finally get back to main, it doesn't have the right registry contents, and it will generally crash. That's why, you know, most attacks cause the server to crash. It is quite an art to make an attack that will not crash the server and still give you control. And as you know, if you've done the uh, hacking class, a lot of the attacks we use damage the target, make it crash, and some of them even do more damage every time you do it until you have to reinstall the OS and stuff. You know, hacking is pretty messy. You're just like smashing a window to go into a house. You're often doing damage you don't really clean up afterwards. Anyway, so... Um, you could, now, you might want to run a function without running the rest of the program, and you can do that. You can just start at the, at the call to the function, and you can load the stack yourself and load the registries yourself, whatever you want them to have, and then run that function. It's something that's kind of a lot of work, and you don't only do that if you have to, but you certainly could do that. Um, you won't be able to return from that and have anything that makes any sense, but you could at least test the function that way. Um, all right. So in practice, um, here's some examples where this was needed. Uh, this is quite common. There's mal malware that is targeted to certain nations and languages uh, because a lot of malware is nation-state attacks. Uh, the Russians do this a lot. They want to attack Estonia and nobody else. The United States wanted to attack Iran and nobody else. This happens all the time. So one, And also, uh, there's, this is what I've been told. I don't know if this is a law, but what I've been told is in practice, you can totally do computer crime from inside Russia, and they don't care at all. You can publish in the newspaper an ad saying, I will hack any company for 300 bucks, just pay me the money and I'll hack in. The only thing they care about is if you hack people inside Russia, then they'll lock you up. So if you do, you typically, if you write malware in Russia, you can totally do it openly as long as you don't hack targets in Russia. So you'll write your code to detect where you are and not work in Russia. <laughs> So here's an example. So there's a real malvirus. You look, and if you're in Chinese, it will uninstall itself and do no harm. If you're in English, it will just do a pop-up, but no harm. But if you're in Japanese or Indonesian, then it'll wipe out the hard drive. So this is somebody that hates the Japanese for some reason and doesn't hate anybody else so much. Let so me guess the Chinese. What's that? Let me guess the Chinese. You might guess the Chinese <laughs> did it. But of course, the other thing, all the attribution people say, remember, it could have been the Japanese trying to make you blame it on the Chinese. You never know. <laughs> you can totally make a false flag operation here that appears to be from somewhere else. But of course, the most obvious thought is apparently it's from the Chinese. Um, so here's how they did it. You call this thing called get system default CID. That will give you a value that tells you what language the machine is set to. And then you just do a series of comparisons. So you compare it to 409. That's English. 411 is Japanese. 421 is Indonesian. CO4 is Chinese. So you compare it to these values, and then you decide to run different code based on those values. So if you were in America, and you ran this, and you wanted to see what would have happened if you were in Indonesia, you could put in a breakpoint here and change the value to make you appear to be in Indonesia, rather than having to install Indonesian on your operating system and then try to use it that way, which is probably going to be no fun. So I've got a few more cahoots, and then we'll do some of this stuff live in Ollie.
a kind of exception doesn't stop code execution. It can usually be ignored. Yeah, that's the first chance. That means something happened that triggered an exception, but it might be expected by the programmer and handled by the program, so it might be okay. If your debugger will give you a chance to mess with it, but you may not need to. Anyway. All right. So which item handles exceptions during normal program execution? Yeah, that's the exception handler, and in Windows, it's the SEH. The structured exception handler array is what does it, and we're going to be exploiting that in the exploitation class, and you'll see it here. Uh, that's Microsoft's system to handle exceptions, and the programmer is supposed to put some stuff in the exception handler to handle those first chance exceptions, and if they don't, then you get those second chance exceptions that lead to crashes and error messages. All right. So ring three process tries to access hardware. What's going to happen? This is a privilege violation, and by the way, this is the point of Spectre and Meltdown. Spectre and Meltdown revealed that when you hit a privilege violation, it triggers an exception, and before that takes effect, you have already executed a bunch more instructions beyond it. So you have already done the forbidden thing. So you can use it to break this rule. And that's how you can crawl out of virtual machines and other virtual machines and elevate yourself to administrator and do all the rotten stuff you're not supposed to be able to do. That is the current disaster facing all the current generation of processors. Anyway, um, so Peter D has got two and Tip has got another one. So that's six and this is nine. And I got a new entry in Valia, which if that's not a real name, Valia, you'll have to tell me who they are. I see a chat message coming in. All right, so let me um, open up my virtual machine. Let me point out the projects. There are several projects for use the debugger, and these are fun because they're standard script kitty stuff. They're not from your textbook yet. We're going to do some simple stuff before getting back to the textbook. So um, here's the simplest one, XE hacking with Ollie debug. So what we're going to do is mess with putty. I didn't already do this one in this class, right? Good, okay. I just I do this at so many workshops, I sort of get confused. All right, so um, I got an old version of Putty. I don't think it was old when I started using it, but I, but I discovered this version has some interesting weird properties, and you'll find it in your machine in the documents folder. There's a copy of Putty. I also have a link where you can download it. It's not the latest version, but it's good enough. So Putty is just a standard Windows uh, client. I made a copy of it called Putty 1. And by the way, the first step is to verify the hash. And I just wrote uh, some of the other projects today to check your hash more often. The checking hashes is a really good way to make sure you're still on track. So before you start, make sure that Putty is the right Putty and undamaged. So take your Putty and you put it in HashCalc, which is in your machine, and it's a free download if you need to put it on some other machine. And then you can calculate all the hash values. And I use SHA-256 for no terribly good reason. In practice, MD5 is probably right, but now we know MD5 in principle can be forged, and SHA-1 can in principle be forged. So if you want to be perfect, you should use SHA-256, so what the hell. So 9F9, followed by more junk, that is the expected value. So. Uh, just to make sure everybody doesn't get too frustrated, I say start out by verifying the hash and make sure you really have 9F9. If not, then you're going to be frustrated <laughs> as you try to do this project because at the end you need to get the right hash value. So if you, what PuTTY does, PuTTY is just a Windows SSH client and it does a few other things. So if you run PuTTY, hey, here PuTTY, what's going on here? It should launch and it looks like for some reason it's hanging on me. How rude. Let's go to Task Manager. Oh, look at that. All right, my putty seems to have crashed somehow. Let me see. Oh, it didn't launch correctly or anything. Neat. Check uh, properties and make sure permission to launch. Don't yeah, that's true. I, I'm pretty sure it has those because I've run it before, but let's see. Maybe not. On the bottom. Uh, this file, no, it might be. That's it. They're right. That's a very good point. I have to unblock it. I don't know how that happened because I thought I'd run this before. I guess I've only run my copy. Anyway, we have to unblock it. If you download a file, Windows will often do this. You're not allowed to run it until you unblock it. By the way, if you go to the command line and run it, it works. This only affects double-clicking it, because the point is to stop you from opening email attachments. Anyway, good point. Thank you. So I'm surprised that happened to me here, because I've been using it all along. But anyway, maybe I've only run it in a debugger. So here's Putty. Putty offers you a chance to connect to a server. I'm going to put in my server, samsclass.info. ad.samsclass.info is one of my servers. That's one that has an open SSH port, that's all. Could use anything. And then I connect, except my mouse seems to be freezing for some reason. Okay, now, I connect, 
And when I connect, it says log in as, and now I can put in a username and password and connect to a server. That's all I want to use of this program, it is this login as banner. And what we're going to do is alter this program to change this functionality as just a simple practice of how you modify code in Ollie. So the first thing I'm going to do is make a copy of the program. I did that before I started here, so I have a copy called Putty1 because I don't want to lose my original um, in case I foul things up. And when you're using Ollie, it is pretty easy to accidentally save the modified version on top of the original version. I've done that a few times, so I try to keep a clean copy of my original file. So let's run it in Ollie, and I think this is just my ad blocker. Yeah, there we go. All right, so we'll start Ollie. It's, of course, installed on your machine, like everything we're using in this class. Okay, and so you can open the file open, or the folder icon, you can open a program, and in the documents, I've got PuTTY1. So it opens the program, and the letters are pretty small. I might be able to make them bigger. If you hit Appearance and Font All, you have a few choices. OEM Fixed is what I got. I think I can do a little better. Um, uh, appearance, Font All. You just have to try a few of these. I think System Fixed. Yeah, System Fixed is a little bigger. and I. I don't know if I can do any better. I'm going to one more try. Um, since uh, Terminal 6, see if that's any better. What about this Lucida? Now, okay, well, that's what I thought. It's better. The best I had was, I think, um, System Fixed. Okay, this is as good as I can make it. So, up there are four panes in Ollie. This is your assembly code, and what happens when you load it in Ollie, it's very strange that GDB does not do this in Linux, it loads the code in RAM, ready to go, and it puts a breakpoint right at the start. So it doesn't run, it gets it ready to go, and then breaks, and that's why it tells you down here, pause. So the first place you look is always down here in the corner. The program is paused. It's not running. So if you're trying to use it or something, it's not going to do anything. It's stopped right here at the first instruction. These are the instructions, push 60, push putty, push things, then call things. This is the general thing you're always going to see in assembler. You're calling subroutines. Before you call a subroutine, you have to push. Those are the arguments. This is a function call of some kind, and those are the arguments. And that's mostly what you do is push, push, call, push, push, call. And then sometimes you do like compare and jump to have an if statement. And then you do more push, push, call, because that's pretty much the main thing you're going to see here. So this is the instructions. Over here is the registers. These are the uh, storage on the processor, which you've seen in uh, Jasmine. So you got the EIP, the ESP, and EBP. This is the top and bottom of the stack. Here's the EIP. The stack starts here at 12 FF8C. This is the stack right here. 12 FF8C. It's showing you the 32-bit words on the stack. So 8C has this 32-bit word, and then the next one up is 4 up and has this one. It's counting up by 4s. This is the whole stack. And if any of these point to anything, it will show you here what they point to. So this is a return pointer when we're done to go back to a kernel routine, which is probably the kernel routine used to launch a program from the desktop when you double-click it. So this will be a return back to Windows when I'm all done, since I just got in. And then I have, this will be returning to something. Here's a pointer to the next SEH record for the SE handler, which we were just talking about. So if there was going to be an exception, it would go over here to find the exception handler and handle it. And on we go. And so, and this is just a general purpose hex dump pane. You can put anything you want there. You can dump the stack there, contents of memory. I don't know what it starts at, but you can, anytime you want to examine some area of memory, you can right click and put it in the dump. And you'll just see it down here in hex and ASCII uh, in case you want to see it. So that's, that's what's going on with Ollie. And now what I want to do is I want to find that login as instruction. Typically, the way you orient yourself in a debugger is you start with something you can read. So in this program, I have this thing called login as that was printed on the screen. So I'd like to find the code that put that on the screen. So to do that, I go up here, right click, and I search for all referenced text strings. It's pretty tiny there, but that's what it says. All right. And now I get a window here, and I'm going to make another attempt to make it bigger. Um, font, yeah, system fixed is slightly better. Anyway, these are all the strings in that program. And up here, I am in PuTTY. One thing that happens is people run the program and end up somewhere funny, and then this is not PuTTY up here. And then, of course, you can't find any of the PuTTY strings in there. So now I'm going to right click in this and search for text. And I'm going to search for login as. 
okay? And I'm going to, uh, case sensitive is okay. It was lowercase. Entire scope would be good. So it goes up and down. So I hit okay, and it finds it. There's a login as up there at 417053. Now, um, there's another one I'm going to find later. What I'm going to do is put a breakpoint on this, um, which you can right click and put a breakpoint there. Toggle breakpoint, and it will turn red. You can also press F2. Now I'm going to find the next one. Right click, search next, and here it finds another one, 41CB6E. I'm going to put a breakpoint on that one too. This is a command that uses it. It's not just the string, it is the push command that pushes a pointer to that string up on the stack. So it's using that string to call a function, probably a print function. And so for some reason, there are two places where that appears in the code. I'm going to hit F2. Now I put breakpoints on both of them. This is how you use breakpoints. Now, to get back to the normal view, you click View, CPU. CPU is the normal view you see here, where you're showing the internals of the CPU, the registers and stuff. So when there are like a dozen other windows, and it's very easy to get lost in those other windows. When you want to get back to normal, you hit View, CPU. And by the way, if you get totally lost, which happens a lot, you do debug, restart, and it will reload the program and start from zero. Um, so anyway, now I'm here. So now I can run the probe. This button right here will run the program. So I'm going to run it. And now it opens a window. Now the windows will not pop to the front, but you'll see them down here on the bar. It has opened. And so it's waiting for input from me. And it tells me in the corner here that it's running. It's not paused anymore, but it's not going to go any further until I put in the input. So I have to put in the name ad.samsclass.info and then click open. Now it continues to run for a while, and now it hits the breakpoint. This is red, and it tells you down here, breakpoint at putty. So now I know which instruction printed that message. This one. There were two of them that would print login as. There was somewhere else in the menu some other login as, but I don't care about. This is the one I care about at 41C86E. I think it's B6E, actually. That's actually kind of handy to remember. 41CB6E. That is the instruction I'm going to mess with. So this instruction pushes onto the stack a pointer to the string login as. Then it calls this function, which is going to print it. So I can change that instruction now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take off the breakpoint. I don't need it anymore. Function F2 will get rid of it. And now I'm going to change that instruction. I can just hit the space bar. That's, this lets me change instructions, assemble. So I'm going to take 467C7C which is the current instruction pointing to login as. And I'm just going to change that C to a D. That will point one byte further along. Now when I do that with assemble, uh, I've got to go back and forth to get back to the... Okay, now, cancel because I'm done. Notice now it says login as because I pointed one byte further down. Now the way C strings work, they are null terminated. So if I move the pointer one byte further, I get the remaining part of the string. Now it's one shorter. That's what I've done. So I've now made a modified version of this code that will print login as. To save it, I right click here and copy to executable all modifications. This is important. I was very frustrated when I first used Ollie at trying to save my results. When you save, when it says all modifications, what it means is all modifications in that segment. And remember, PE files have a variety of segments. If I change two or three things in different segments and try to save them, it won't work. The best procedure is save it after each change. Otherwise, you will get very frustrated. So I'm going to save it, copy to executable, copy all. And here I have a window called putty1.exe. I'm going to right click and save file. And I'm going to call this putty2. This is my general procedure when doing all kinds of work like this. Save a lot of partial products because very often something awful happens and you wish you could go back one or two steps to the one that was working and try again. So I'm going to call this one putty2 and save it. And now I can use it. So I'm going to, I guess I'm going to nuke Ollie. I can start it again, but I think next time I'm going to want to disassemble a different program. So let's take a look at putty2. If I go into documents, now there's a file here called putty2, so I can run that. When I give it a name, ad.samsclass.info, then I can open it down here, there. That didn't take it, I gotta use the mouse, okay, which is kind of annoying in this zoomed environment. Okay, now I open it, 
and now it prints Oganez. So I've now made a modified version of Putty, and it runs. Now, this should not be possible, by the way. This is why you have signed code. You shouldn't want someone modifying your code. I've done only one very small modification, but you shouldn't be able to modify code at all. And we're going to see later, this is, in fact, signed code. Somebody at Microsoft could enlighten me why in the hell I'm able to do this to sign code. <laughs> but I am. And in fact, I might as well mention, this is signed code, and you can see that here. If you take PuTTY 1, the original unmodified file, and you right-click and go to Properties, there is a tab for digital signatures. And if you go there, it's made by this Simon Tatum guy. When you go to Details, it tells you the signature is OK. So it has a signature, and it knows what has been modified, and it's not been modified. Now, the one I just modified is PuTTY 2. If you go here, it's got a Digital Signatures tab. And if you look for the details, it's not OK. But did it warn me? No. Did it not run? No. What the hell is this? It knows it's broken, and it just blithely runs it without telling me I'm annoyed by this. Anyway, that's the way it is. It's handy for us, so we can totally put Trojans in there. I don't know why they bothered putting a signature on it, if that's all it does. But, but that's the wonder of Microsoft security. Yeah? Is there any easy way of like checking all of the files in Windows to see which digital signatures that's are a, valid? That's a very good question. There is a thing called Verify that will check all the drivers. There's a thing called SFC, Scan Now, that will check all the system files. But I'm not aware of a way to check every file's signature. Probably you can do it with PowerShell or something, but I don't know exactly how it is. Yeah. Certainly, is that, that, you know, it would seem like a really good if idea. You're trying to hunt for the malware and you're trying to, clearly the operating system doesn't do it on its own, but that's yeah. how you could. I know, absolutely. I would think anything that is signed ought to not run if the signature is bad. That would make sense to me, but that doesn't appear to be the case here. And I'm sure there is some reasonable for it, but I don't know what it is. I would assume it's probably that PuTTY didn't exactly put the signature on the way Microsoft expected it to be on there or something. But anyway, so now I've modified PuTTY, so I can modify it more. Um, so you can. Professor, uh, yeah. quick question. Yeah. Is this, is, is this common in programs to, to manipulate it like that or no? Uh, this is what hackers do all the time. Script kiddies do it to cheat on games. Um, and. Uh, it's useful for us to learn how to, and you do it a lot when you're reversing malware, which is what we're going to do. So modifying code is not that common, although it's an option. It's a way to learn how to use the debugger. But normally, you only modify it for purposes of testing things. Anyway, so um, but you can totally, by the way, use this to go past product keys and login pages and jump to the winning page and skip over the hard level of a game. You know, all these things, that's what this is for. That's why, all right, so anyway, so we've done that. Uh, now we can alter the login message that way. Uh, we can also, this removed a letter from the message. That's what I did in this one. You can even, now I can modify the whole message to say something else. So let me try that. This PuTTY 2 starts one letter down. So I'm going to debug it again with Ollie. Um, and because it's worth seeing how to modify the code section. So the text section, pardon me. So let's we go back to Ollie. Let's look at a few more tricks here. PuTTY 2 is my modified file. I'm going to modify it again. So here we are. Now, if I can show you the sections, let me see if I, I'm going to try again to make my window, my font bigger, but maybe a lost cause. A system fixed font, is that better? Not really. All right. Anyway, um, so I'm going to view memory. And I'm going to again try to make this bigger. I hope somebody sends me a message or something if there's any way to get this thing to go to a bigger font and stay there. I don't know what it is. I have to keep doing it over and over. Anyway, this is the memory map of the running process. There's a lot of other things happening, but these are all the PuTTY processes. So PuTTY is here. It has a PE header, and it has four sections, text, R data, data, and resource. These are common PE headers. Text contains the executable code. Data and R data contain the variables, the stored strings and stuff, and the resource section contains other things like maybe the shape of icons and stuff. So uh, the text is what we modified this time. We changed a, uh, a push instruction to refer to a different address. That's in a text section. We're going to mess with some of the data now. So let's go back to that same instruction. Now here I'm in a funny window, so I go view CPU to get back to normal. And now I want to go to this address. I can just right-click, go to expression. 
Uh, let me, this, this tiny font is driving me nuts. Let me see if I can make this lower resolution or something, because I think it's senseless when nobody can see it. Okay. Now if I open the file, and it, this is nice and big here. If I, this might be good, let's see. Open, I said, putty, open. Well, I think it's a little bigger. I think this is actually how I had it when I did my videos. It's, it's actually quite a bit bigger than what we had, about half this. Anyway, so the point is I'm here, and so I want to go to that instruction. This is, in fact, bigger. So right-click, go to Expression, and the expression is 41CB6E. It's already there. That's the instruction we found by putting in breakpoints. That's that push. And if I move this over, you can see it's pushing AUG in as. So, what I can do is I can point here and right click on that and I can follow it in the dump. The immediate constant. And so I've taken this instruction, this is the op code, this is the address. So it's 68 and this is the address which points to this address 467C7D. You see it's backwards, 00467C7D. And let me see if this chat message is something I should do something about. It looks fine viewing through Zoom. Good. Glad to hear it. Thank you. Good. That's why I think this is better now. The previous one only looked readable all because I was zooming in in a way that remote people can't see it. This is about the best. Now, the point is, um, so this is the immediate constant. And so I followed it here. I say, this is the aug in S. And if I scroll up a little, there's the L. This is the stored text log in S, and it put the pointer of it on the stack, and then it called a print routine. So I can change the message by changing that pointer, by cutting off a letter, but I can also change the message by changing the stored data down here. So if I go down here, I can just um, insert new data. And um, I don't remember how to do it. Let me check my instructions. Highlight all of them. Highlight all of them? Is that what you do? Thank you. Good. I didn't make so. D-A-R-K-N-E-S-S. Yes, that was my plan, to put it in darkness. And then what, press enter or something? Oh, I think right click. Right click. And then uh, edit. Edit binary. Binary. Binary, thank you, good. Binary edit, good, good. Yeah, now I can put in stuff, and again, this is this horrible stuff where some of the window is big and some of it isn't. But I can go to ASCII. I can put in darkness. There. And now that I've done that, I can say OK. So now this has changed, and it turns red to show me it's changed. So now I have to save the changes. I have to right-click down here, not up here, because this is not the text segment. This is the text segment, and I changed that before. To save this, I have to right-click down here and copy to executable. And here's the file, and now I have to right-click, save file, and this is going to be putty 3. And uh, hopefully I can figure out how to hit the save button. Uh, maybe I can't. Where's the bloom and save button? It's, yeah. You see it? I don't see it. Correct. Save file as. Where's the button? Um, I think it is hopelessly unreachable. Um, I think I have to guess where it is. If I'm hitting tab, I'm eventually hitting it. Yeah, there's this, this. The first one is saved, the second one's canceled. Let's assume the first one's saved. Hopefully I saved it. Um, that's, that's what I get for not knowing quite how to zoom things in, right? Um, all right, there is a thing called putty three, so I think I saved it. All right, and so now this one should print up darkness, ad.samsclass.info. And um, I again have the same problem that I can't reach the connect button. So I have to sort of, I think that's it, maybe not. Oh, there, okay, and there it goes, printing dark. So now I've made a modified version. So that's the joy of modifying stuff in Ollie. And let me just point out, I don't, I think that's enough for one night, but after that, there's a couple more projects. This one here, you actually put in a Trojan that will create a listening process and give you more control of the machine into, into that program. And this one here is from a CTF where you have very simple little DOS games that you have to cheat at. A DOS game asks you for a password and you just skip over the code. In fact, it's only 7.30. Let me show you that one because that one is actually much simpler. That's why I put them in this order. Let's take a look at that because this is actually very easy. So let's take a look at this next thing to attack, which is 
Um, in the documents folder, there is a file called 0000.exe. This was from a challenge in a CTF where you had to patch 67,000 of these, which was pretty awesome, but I'm only going to do one tonight. So, um, this is a command line program, so if you go to documents, and then you run it, it says launch codes, and when you say one, it says, I think my dog figured this out before you. It insults you for not knowing the launch code. So you're supposed to know the magic code, and if you don't, it laughs at you. It's a game. If you get the right answer, it will tell you a word, a letter. And then if you solve thousands of them, it spells something out, and that was the challenge. So um, we, this is a game, and the game is you have to guess the code, and I failed. So that's what it does. And that's the great thing about this game is I think they actually wrote this game in Assembler because it is so easy to see in Ollie, which is very nice. And of course, that's the point of it. It's a CTF. It's a training project to teach you to do this. So they tried to make what could arguably be the simplest program in the world to debug. So remember the logic I've said before, always start on the right. Over here is nice, easy, readable stuff. Launch codes put S, that's a C command. So it puts that on the screen. Then it scans a number in percent %D from the user. Then it prints, wow, you got it, or it prints, I think my dog found it. So this is failure, this is winning. OK, so now I can try reading the actual instructions, which are pretty simple. Here it prints a message to prompt me. Here it um, reads something from the user. Now it does a compare and a jump. So it compares it to something to see if it's the right message. And then it does a jump to either print this message or that message. So I don't even have to try to understand the rest of it. This is an if. Obviously, the if is comparing the answer to the right answer. Now, there are different one, one way to solve this would be to figure this out, find the right answer, and learn what the right answer is and put in the right answer. And that would be fine. <coughs> Another way to do it would be to <coughs> find out what it's going to print when you win and find that here, and then you have the output. Those would be pretty cool. But if you're totally a lamer like me, you do the simplest thing, which is to just make me win. So it's going to do a comparison. And if it doesn't jump, then I win. If I get it wrong, it jumps. So all I have to do is not jump. OK. So all I really have to do is get rid of that jump instruction. Now, I've, I could get rid of the comparison, too, but it doesn't really matter. All that really matters is getting rid of the jump. I'll get rid of both of them. So I click on that. I press space. Oops, I hate to print it. We had code. OK. I hit that command. It hit space. And here it is, jump something. I just put in NOP instead, and then assemble. And it fills it with NOPs. So it did not do the comparison. So let's get rid so cancel this, because I'm done with that. Now I get rid of this one, too, with space, and Why put in NOP. Uh, because it was the instruction itself was six bytes long. Ah, okay. And it doesn't break an instruction in half. It puts it on the whole instruction, fills with NOPs. And that's this option here, fill with NOPs. I could do one byte at a time, but then I'd probably ruin everything. Because it, and everything. Yeah, if, if, it was to, if I was to jump like here, halfway through an instruction, it would misunderstand everything and just crash. So you generally want to replace a whole instruction or leave it alone. So I'm going to replace this one with NOP also. Now I have a modified version of the program. Now I could save it and run it, and that's what you'll have to do in the project to get the right MD5 hash. But if I just wanted to win, I could just run it right in the debugger. And that's what I'm going to do. So I, now I'm going to run the modified program. It pops up a box here and says launch codes. And now when I give it one, I win. Because the modified program will always win. And the answer is J. And you'll notice as you go through these, there are several levels of this, you're getting some strings. All the strings are nonsense because this it's all it was JavaScript colon, and everything after that was punctuation marks, because there is a language I might as well mention in case you don't know this. There are certain esoteric languages out there. And one of the most prominent is called BrainFuck. This is BrainFuck and JSFuck. So if you haven't come across them, you should know the joy of these. This is BrainFuck. <coughs> this is a type of programming called esoteric programming languages. It, there are people who deliver <coughs> languages to be as difficult as possible <coughs> as a game and a stunt. So BrainFuck uses absolutely nothing but punctuation marks. That's it. There are eight symbols in the language. And that is uh, there. That is Hello World. That mess will print out Hello World on the terminal. So this is BrainFuck. 
So for people who find that not confusing enough, they invented JS fuck. But then it has to have its own compiler, right? Of course. And there are compilers online. So you can totally write in that language if you want to like drive everyone around you insane. And of course, if you actually want to understand language and compiler design and stuff, it is kind of an interesting intellectual exercise. And so here is the joy of JS fuck, which is what this stuff is. The original, there were 60, this is JS fuck. I don't know why, but in JavaScript, this is valid JavaScript. So that is alert one. You can put this in web pages and it will run. Somebody who knows more about JavaScript than me could tell me why. This junk containing nothing but punctuation marks is somehow valid JavaScript. But it turns out to take thousands of these punctuation marks to print like a few characters. So this alert one turns into that. So the original CTF, there were 67,000 games like that. You have to hack them all, win them all, and it, you get 67,000 of this. And that was actually broken. And when you figure out how to fix it and run it, it then prints out the flag, which was like 20 characters. It took 67,000 of these things to print out a 20 character flag. I didn't give you all of it. I gave you some small pieces of it. So the point is, once you've done the first one here, um, which is the one I just showed you, patching an EXE, that's so easy I made it worth only 10 points. But this is kind of the craziest project I've written as far as points. 10 points plus 70 points extra credit. Because once you've done one, you can begin moving up. By the way, if you want to do the whole 67,000, you can link and do that. I'll give you more for that. I didn't even put that in here because I didn't figure anybody really wanted to go up there. So you did one, and that's what I required. Then the next one, you got to do three. And uh, I just have to refresh the page to see the pictures there. So I totally put in instructions how to do one. And then for extra credit, you can do three. So there's a zip file that will give you three of these to crash. And you can even do them one by one in the debugger. And that was my plan. You can do three of them one at a time. Then you can do um, 19 of them. Now, at this point, you're probably going to have to begin scripting it. And so I have hints here, a series of hints showing you how to do it. You need to write a Python script. It is actually very easy, even if you've never used Python for it before, to make a Python script that reads something in and then prints it out to a file. And you can just remove some bytes and turn them into 90. You can totally automate this process. Take about eight bytes, turn them into 90, and print it back out into a file and then run it. And once you get it automated, then you might as well go up the next step. Last one, 256 of them. Um, the, I made it easier. I, I forget, I, a few years away since I did this, the original one, they weren't all the same. There were like four different types. And you had to figure them out independently and write a detector to pick them. I think I made all these the first type to spare you that complexity. But anyway, if you, get, if you want to keep going, um, you just have to find Easy CTF 2017, which I think is on, still up. You could find the original 67K challenge and get the original one with the 67,000. It took me like days. After I decoded them all, then I had the, the JS fuck and it wouldn't run. And I figured out it was broken. Like a, a hundred characters are missing from the end and you have to figure out what's needed to finish completing all the punctuation. And that was possible. It took me a while to figure that out. But you have to repair the JS fuck and then it prints out the flag. So that was, that was pretty educational. I learned a lot, but anyway. The point here is to learn Ollie, and there's some practice for Ollie if you like. But you should all be able to do the first part because that you have instruction for. The rest are challenges, and uh, you can't really do the last two unless you're willing to do a little bit of Python or some kind of coding in some kind of language. But Python is the best, and you really don't need to know much of anything. I gave you an example to start from. Anyway, give it a shot. That's enough for one night, I think. Um, I'll go up to the lab after I clean up here and help anybody <coughs> want to work there for a while.